This is a production of Cornell University Library. Hello, everyone. I'm Tom Taviano, the Business and Economics Librarian at MAN, and I'm delighted to be welcoming you all today to, to today's Chats in the Stacks book talk with Dr. Iswar Prasad. Today's book talk opens MAN's book talk series for the fall 2021 semester. We'll be hosting several more this semester with other unit libraries in the Cornell University Library System hosting several of their own. For a look at the lively range of speakers and titles featured, please visit the book talk link that my colleague has posted in the chat. Due to ongoing COVID-19 infection mitigation efforts at Cornell, all, book talk, all library book talks for the fall semester will be virtual webinars. They all include opportunity for questions, which audience members can pose via the chat function in your webinar view. Please feel free to submit your questions via chat at any time during today's presentation, and I will present them to our speaker in the Q&A portion of the webinar. I will introduce questions by using the asker's first name uh, unless anonymity is specifically requested. If you would like captions for this presentation, they can be toggled by clicking on the CC live transcript button at the bottom right in the Zoom interface. Before proceeding to my introduction for uh, Professor Prasad, I'd like to include an acknowledgement that Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gai Kahono, Cayuga Nation. The Gai Kahono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Gai Kahono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gaia Kahono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. And now to our speaker. Dr. Iswar Pasad is the Nanlal P. Talani Senior Professor of Trade Policy and Professor of Economics at the Charles H. Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management at Cornell University. He is also a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, where he holds the New Century Chair in International Economics and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He was previously chief of the Financial Studies Division in the IMF's Research Department, and before that was the head of the IMF's China Division. Professor, Prashad, Professor Prashad's research has spanned a number of areas, including labor economics, business cycles, and open economy macroeconomics. Through a publishing and engagement record that is both distinguished and extensive, his impact on research, policymaking, and education in national and international finance and financial sector reform has been broad and consequential. He has authored, co-authored, and edited several books and monographs on financial globalization, China, and India. His articles have appeared in numerous collective volumes and top academic journals. Through op-ed articles and appearances on various major national and international news media, he has helped make a better understanding of current issues in international finance and development possible for a wide global public. On multiple occasions, he has testified before the Senate Finance Committee, House of Representatives Committee on Financial Services, and the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission. Dr. Prashad's current research includes the in, uh, interests include the macroeconomics of globalization, the structures of the international financial and monetary system, and the Chinese and Indian economies. His newest book, The Future of Money, which has been described as a single volume masterpiece with all one needs to know about an amazing upcoming turning point on, in monetary policy, shows us where his re recent work has led him. Please join me in giving Professor Prashad a warm welcome. Thank you, Tom, for that introduction. And um, thank you also to your uh, Man Library colleagues um, who've put together this event. It is really a pleasure to be uh, with all of you. And this is truly a Cornell book in the truest sense of the term, because um, in addition to Cornell being my home, um, there are many Cornell students who actually helped me uh, with the background research for this book, uh, many undergraduates and some graduate students as well, uh, who helped in my thinking on these issues. And of course, many of my academic colleagues, both in the Ithaca campus um, and at Cornell Tech, including some of our colleagues in the Initiative for Cryptocurrencies, have been really helpful in sharpening my thinking um, about some of these issues. 
So when I started this book, my objective was really to think about um, central bank digital currencies, which I will talk about during this talk. And this came about because, you know, I hang out with central bankers a lot. And about three or four years ago, I started getting questions about digital currencies and what they might mean for finance and monetary policy. You know, um, I didn't have many good answers to this, so I decided to go out and read up um, on this. And it turned out that there wasn't very much to read up on because uh, this was all fairly new. So I decided to start um, thinking in a more structured way about this. And soon it became apparent to me that as I thought about central bank digital currencies, that is digital forms of what we now know as currency, one needed to think about the broader development in financial markets that come under the rubric of this term fintech. And that led me into thinking more about cryptocurrencies and having to learn about them, which was a very exciting um, uh, and intellectually demanding process. And then thinking about how all of these changes might affect things that matter to us. Um, things like um, the global financial system, but also more basic concepts of money, banking, and finance. So that's the broad overview. Um, but of course, it's worth thinking about what set off this entire technological revolution that we're going to talk about today. In um, economics and finances and everything else, getting the timing right is really crucial. And let me take you back to those dark days of September 2008, where the global financial crisis got started. September 15, 2008 was a particularly dark moment in US and indeed global financial history. That's the date referred to as the Lehman moment um, when Lehman Brothers um, essentially went under and threatened to take the entire financial system uh, in the US and abroad down with it. So this was a period um, right after um, all of this happened when it seemed like there was declining trust in both um, government and um, commercial financial institutions, especially the large banks. So the time was ripe for something that happened right about six weeks after the Lehman moment. So in late October of 2008, this blog post appeared um, uh, on a particular chat group. And what is important is the date here, October 31, 2008. Um, and it's by this uh, um, person with the digital identity, Satoshi Nakamoto, who says very modestly, I've been working on a new electronic cash system um, that is supposed to be uh, fully decentralized, peer-to-peer uh, -peer with no trusted third party. And this paper turned out to be the beginning of the revolution. The first version of Bitcoin was actually released in January. And again, um, the time was ripe for something to come up. And the objective of Bitcoin was really to set up um, a payment system that would allow electronic uh, payments to be conducted, but crucially without relying on central bank money or a bank or other financial institution. So this sounds like magic. How on earth are you going to be able to do it? especially because Bitcoin promised that not only could you do uh, this magic, but could do it without revealing your true identity. That is just using your digital identities, a concept referred to as pseudonymity. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how Bitcoin achieved this marvelous uh, objective. It turns out that Bitcoin is in fact not great at doing what it was supposed to do, but the technology turns out to have um, really remarkable effects. Now, where does cryptography enter into this? Because when you hear about cryptocurrencies, you might assume um, that a lot of this stuff is based on cryptography. It turns out that Bitcoin is actually remarkably transparent. There is an element of cryptography that enters into this, and that is in the form of cryptographic systems that generate pairs of keys, um, public and private uh, digital keys, which are crucial to the operation of uh, uh, Bitcoin. And um, you can think about this as analogous to your um, computer, uh, you know, bank account, where your account number um, might be um, uh, shareable with other people, but they can't do anything with it unless you know the password, which is really a private key. There are also other elements from cryptography that are relevant here. And one of the building blocks is something called a hash function. Um, what a hash function is basically is, is a cryptographic tool that takes any random block of text or numbers and translates it 
into a particular format um, that makes it very difficult to um, break the code very easily. And I'll explain this a bit more in a second. And another element is something called distributed ledger technology. So a hash function basically is um, uh, something um, that you take any input, it gives you an output in a standardized format. Um, now, I have a very simplified hash function just, um, shown here. And what is important to note is that if you make even the slightest change to the input, the output changes completely. And it turns out that um, hash functions used in Bitcoin, for instance, are much more complex, of course. And what is crucial is that you cannot back out from the hash function what the input was. Um, so this property turns out to be very important in being able to identify, for instance, transactions. So if you take um, certain key elements of a transaction, uh, what the digital identities of the transacting parties are, uh, who is paying whom, uh, what the amount of the transaction is, and then run that information through a hash function, you can get a digital signature of that, a digital fingerprint of that transaction, which is unique um, to that transaction. Distributed ledgers um, are an interesting development as well that predate um, Bitcoin, but Bitcoin uses them in a very effective way. So typically one can think about accounts being maintained by a centralized party, it could be a commercial bank um, or another financial institution, but distributed ledgers are maintained on multiple computers around the world um, and they are synchronized in real time. So each ledger has exactly the same information, but in addition, they are transparent. Um, so distributed ledgers don't necessarily have to be transparent, but Bitcoin, as I'm going to show you, is remarkable that in fact, um, while you might think it's very secretive, in fact, all Bitcoin transactions are publicly available for anybody to see. And this radical transparency turns out to be crucial. So the challenges that Bitcoin tries to solve are really remarkably complicated ones. How do you validate transactions without a trusted party? How do you achieve consensus in a decentralized network that certain transactions are valid? How do you verify them? And how do you make sure that if people have digital money in their account, that they don't double spend uh, that money, that is to say, use it for multiple transactions? And the way the Bitcoin um, uh, algorithm solves this problem is through what is called a consensus protocol. That is everybody in the community or all the computer nodes um, that are acting as validators have to agree that certain transactions are valid. And the way this works is a very interesting process called mining. Essentially what happens is that Bitcoin network throws up um, a completely randomly generated numerical problem that can only be solved by brute computing power. And whoever solves that problem first gets to have the privilege of validating that block of transactions and confirming that they are in fact uh, valid transactions. And what happens then is that you have the settlement of these transactions by essentially having the account balances of all the people who are using Bitcoin updated on the network. And why do Bitcoin miners do all of this? Because after all, computing power does uh, cost real money. You have to pay for energy, you have to pay for computers. The answer is that they get rewarded with Bitcoin. And it turns out this process of mining not only validates transactions, but also is the process by which new Bitcoin are generated. So this is a simple graphical um, conceptual description about how Bitcoin works. People who have Bitcoin and want to transact with it, either paying for goods and services or transferring that money to somebody else on the network, post those transactions on the network. These are collated into blocks. Those blocks are validated. And then these blocks are chained together um, using computer algorithms to all the previous transactions. This is where the term blockchain comes in. So blocks of transactions are recursively linked to each other. So now you have a very long and complex distributed ledger complex, not because of the complexity of the information, but because of the amount of information in there. Um, so this information is distributed to computers on the network that then maintain this um, in a synchronized fashion. So every Bitcoin transaction um, in history is available for you out there to see, um, so long as you know uh, where to look. So this radical transparency actually provides some security because now when you have some malevolent actors who try to uh, tamper with certain transactions, they can be very quickly um, identified and those illegitimate transactions then get kicked out. 
Now, Bitcoin has not worked very well as, um, uh, as a medium of exchange, which was its ostensible function. Um, as you probably heard, Bitcoin is very unstable value. Um, so you can't really use it very effectively. And it also has very slow processing time. The number of transactions that can be handled on the network is, um, um, is very limited. So it's failed in its basic purpose. There has been some concern that Bitcoin fuels illicit activities, although it turns out that this digital anonymity is not as secure as one might expect. Um, certainly, there have been ransomware attacks where um, those attackers have demanded payment in Bitcoin, but it takes a fair bit of technological sophistication to hide your trails, even using Bitcoin. And then I talked about those digital private keys. Um, if you lose your um, password to your bank account, you can go to your bank uh, and retrieve the password. Um, with Bitcoin, you lose your private key um, and it's gone. And it has happened to a lot of people. So curiously, Bitcoin has become a speculative financial asset now that people hold on to. Why do people think that Bitcoin has value, given that it doesn't seem to have any intrinsic value? Among Bitcoin adherents, um, there seems to be this token of faith that unlike dollars that can be printed at will by the Federal Reserve, um, uh, Bitcoin actually is a scarce commodity. Um, there are going to be at most 21 million Bitcoins get, that can be created. About 18 and a half million have been created so far. Um, so scarcity is believed to be an underpinning of Bitcoin's value. But when economists, this is a very dubious proposition. After all, something that doesn't have any intrinsic value, just because it's scarce, um, is probably not going to retain value. So. I don't hold any Bitcoin and I would recommend you don't uh, um, either. Another problem is, is this validation process of transactions is really environmentally very destructive. Right now, there are very specialized machines called ASICs or application specific integrated circuits that are devoted just to cryptocurrency mining. And this is a picture of a cryptocurrency mine with zillions of these uh, ASICs uh, chained together. Um, this takes up a huge amount of energy. There are some estimates that somewhere between half to 1% of global electricity consumption is consumed uh, by Bitcoin mining. And of course, you generate a lot of computer detritus. So Bitcoin has really not been good for the environment. But what has uh, um, transpired as a result of um, the technology set up by Bitcoin is that you now have new cryptocurrencies that try to fix many of the flaws of Bitcoin. Unstable value is a major problem and there are new stable coins um, that try to get around this problem by essentially being backed up by reserves of um, um, fiat currencies. So for instance, there is a stable coin called Tether that is ostensibly backed up um, by dollar denominated assets, uh, including treasury securities. There are alternative ways of um, validating transactions that are much more um, environmentally friendly um, and are also much more efficient. There are new cryptocurrencies that offer much more anonymity which one might uh, worry can be used again for illicit activities. Um, but these are somewhat more cumbersome to use, um, somewhat thankfully. And then, of course, Facebook plans to issue its own cryptocurrency called DM, as though Facebook doesn't control um, enough of our uh, social lives as it is. But they're trying to meet a real need, or at least that's what um, Zuckerberg tells us, um, that this um, um, Facebook-backed um, cryptocurrency coin would essentially be uh, backed up by reserves of uh, dollar um, uh, instruments, um, and it would provide a way of um, giving access to low-cost digital payments, both within and across countries, um, to people who want that. And then, of course, you have meme coins like Dogecoin, um, which are even more out there. Um, but certainly the fact that you have all these cryptocurrencies together having a value of somewhere in the range of two and a half trillion dollars uh, is um, uh, suggesting that we can't um, lightly dismiss cryptocurrencies as a phenomenon. Um, but what I think is far more interesting is the technological revolution that Bitcoin has set off. And it is creating the basis for something called a decentralized finance. And decentralized finance is built like Bitcoin on decentralized blockchains, but it allows a broad range of financial transactions to be conducted without um, these third parties or trusted intermediaries. One example of, is that of smart contracts, which actually allow 
um, certain transactions to take place, for instance, buying a house, buying a car, um, or just exchanging a financial instrument without a um, real estate attorney or a broker being present. And remarkably enough, this crazy sounding future is already here. Uh, this is a pictorial description of a very simple smart contract. Um, in fact, um, a smart contracts have functionality that is way beyond this. So basically the way it works is you have computer code um, that sets it up such that two parties who want to exchange something, let's say uh, one of them wants to sell, um, uh, corporate bond or um, maybe um, uh, some other financial asset uh, to another person. They both agree to this contract, um, which is all embedded in computer code. And then the computer code essentially becomes the escrow account. That is one party deposits a financial asset, the other party deposits a payment, and the smart contracts make sure that those conditions are met. And when those conditions are met, it executes a contract and the contract um, can then be settled by the um, money being transferred to the account, um, the digital wallet um, of the person who had the bond and the bond's ownership gets transferred um, to the person who's buying the bond. And this is again, a very simple version of the remarkable functionality that smart contracts actually have. Now, decentralized finance sounds at one level a bit crazy, but in fact, um, it has a number of advantages because you have uh, this distributed ledger um, system. You essentially don't have a single point of failure, uh, which actually makes these systems more resilient and more um, uh, resilient, not just to failures, but also to attacks. And it turns out that you know one malevolent institution, uh, and some people think the government may be a malevolent institution, cannot really um, control this and the governance is by the community. So it is permissionless, that is to say anybody can use it, nobody can stop you from using it, and anybody can verify the execution of a transaction. And um, DeFi actually has given way to um, remarkable um, financial products. So it turns out that it actually allows you to combine different um, modular projects. So these have been described as financial Legos because you can sort of stick them together and create completely new products. I've given you an example again of a product that already exists it's of people essentially um, using whatever cryptocurrencies they may have uh, to put it into um, a, a sort of deposit account so that, that uh, um, those cryptocurrencies can be used by other people who want the liquidity. And then multiple people um, who put their deposits into these uh, accounts um, then enter a lottery game where the winner of that lottery gets the uh, price, which is um, the interest rate that each person would have got. So everybody who put their money into this contract gets the original principal back. The winner gets the principal back plus um, the interest that everybody would have gotten. So it gives more of an incentive for people to participate. Again, this sounds crazy, but it already exists. Um, so there are many other products coming along. Of course, um, the notion uh, that technology can solve all problems is something we should worry a little bit about. Uh, in principle, regulatory compliance tools can be plugged in, but there are a variety of risks uh, that emerge, especially uh, because these are new and innovative products and um, there are obviously huge incentives for hackers who have to be very sophisticated to break these systems uh, to actually try and make off some money. So there are some vulnerabilities to be thought about. Now, amid all of this, what is happening um, to central banks, who after all um, play very big roles in creating money, these are four of the major central banks around the world, they haven't been sitting quietly, recognizing these remarkable changes that are taking place and the possibilities that have been created by these innovations, they are moving forward as well with thinking about digital versions of their fiat currencies. So I will refer to these as central bank digital currencies or CBDC. Why are central banks considering CBDC? It turns out that there are very good reasons. You know, cash is a payment mechanism, um, but many of us now use digital payments. You know, you just use your swipe of your phone. Um, when you go to um, Ithaca Bakery or to um, Man Cafe uh, to pay for your um, beverages or food. Um, but it turns out that there is a large part of the population in many developing countries. And even in a country like the US, 
where to use Apple Pay, you need to be able to link it back to a credit card or a bank account, which many people do not have. So a central bank uh, digital currency, especially if it was set up in the form of an account that you could have with the Federal Reserve um, or the central bank. And in fact, the technology now exists for each of us to be able to have an account with the central bank and for the central bank to be able to manage this. Then we might have everybody having easy access to a very low cost digital payment system. Um, so you could have better payment system, but also in countries such as Sweden, where the private sector is doing a perfectly fine job of creating very good uh, uh, payment systems that people use. There is the concern that maybe if the entire payments infrastructure is in the hands of the private sector, it creates some vulnerabilities with people start getting a little worried about the financial stability of those payment providers, the entire economy could freeze up. So Sweden is um, undertaking a trial of uh, CBDC and e-krona because um, they want to have a backstop um, to the private payments infrastructure. And in some countries, there is also a desire to maintain the relevance for central bank money at the retail um, level, that is in day-to-day uh, -day transactions. Um, so CBDC have many benefits in addition to those I already spoke about, um, such as broadening financial inclusion and uh, enabling the shift to digital payments. Um, a lot of corruption, a lot of illegal activities are um, intermediated through cash. Um, so eliminating cash and having digital forms of payments will create digital traces for every financial transaction. This is not going to eliminate corruption or illicit commercial activities, but at least it means that central bank money cannot be used for that anymore. And it will bring a lot of economic activity out of the shadows. And some of this could be perfectly legitimate activity, you know, paying your babysitter or your gardener with cash um, um, that may not get reported uh, for tax purposes, um, either by you um, or by the gardener or babysitter. And these are small amounts and maybe it doesn't matter that much, but the less cash is used and the more you have digital payments, the more activity is going to come into the tax net. Of course, um, uh, an increase in tax revenues may not necessarily be seen by everybody as a good thing as it may um, uh, help the government uh, grow and perhaps do good things. There are other advantages as well. During the um, early stages of the coronavirus pandemic, the US government sent out coronavirus stimulus uh, payments. Um, those who had direct deposit information on file with the IRS were able to get that money right away, but others um, got um, prepaid debit cards, checks in the mail, uh, some of which got lost, some of which got misappropriated. Um, so if each of us had an account at the central bank, it would be much easier uh, for a central bank to undertake what are called helicopter drops of money. That is, all qualified people could easily get money deposited into their accounts. Um, you could also have, um, in desperate circumstances where the government is trying to encourage consumption and investment, you can actually have something that is infeasible in an economy with cash, which is negative nominal interest rates. Um, cash has a zero nominal interest rate. A um, hundred dollar bill today is a hundred dollar bill, uh, you know, two years from now. Certainly inflation may eat away at its purchasing power, uh, but in nominal terms, um, that um, uh, dollar is still worth the same. Uh, at a time of huge financial peril when an economy is collapsing, a government may want to have negative interest rates um, so that rather than saving up their money, um, businesses will go out and invest, consumers will go out and spend. And in fact, um, in the years after the financial crisis, many countries around the world, although not the US, did try to put in place uh, negative uh, interest rates. Now, these are admittedly very desperate um, policy tools for desperate circumstances. And um, I would not suggest that any central bank would consider using them lightly. Uh, but it's good to know that with the CBDC, such possibilities exist if we were to face really perilous economic times again. But a CBDC has risks as well. If we all had access to central bank accounts, we might decide that, especially uh, in difficult economic times, we want to move our money from commercial banks, even if our deposits are insured there, and move them to central bank accounts. This could cause the banking system to collapse. And even in normal times, if the government provided a low cost digital payment system, that could block um, you know, private agents from um, creating their own payments innovation. After all, who can compete um, with an entity such as the government? 
Plus, there are concerns, of course, about um, potential hacks um, of our central bank uh, accounts, as well as loss of privacy. After all, any transaction that leaves a digital trace, um, there is a concern that you might lose um, uh, privacy and confidentiality in your transactions. So there are some real risks, but it turns out that there are experiments being undertaken by many countries, which suggest that there might be ways using technology and good design choices to mitigate, if not entirely eliminate these risks. For instance, um, China's experiment um, uh, with its digital currency um, suggests that there might be a way to set up different types of digital wallets. So you could have very low value digital wallets that you could use for very low value transactions where the government may not collect um, uh, much information on those transactions. But once a transaction value crosses a certain threshold, then you might want to um, make sure that the government uh, uh, or the government may want to make sure that it knows that its money is being uh, put to good use. Um, what about the flight of deposits into the banking system? It turns out that the Bahamas, which has issued the first nationwide central bank digital currency, has found a simple solution to this, which is you cap the amount of money that can be kept in a central bank uh, uh, digital currency account. So there are ways around this. and. Um, with these uh, um, uh, technological and design choices, many countries are beginning to move forward. I already mentioned the first um, nationwide CBDC that has been rolled out uh, in the Bahamas at the sand dollar. Um, there are trials in progress around the world. Um, China, Sweden, and Japan have already initiated central bank digital currency trials. Uh, many countries are in the planning stages of the trials, and the US Federal Reserve, um, our very own central bank, is planning to release some research um, on the technical design and prospects of a digital currency um, any day now. Um, so I think as we look at the broad landscape, there are certain things that are pretty um, clear in terms of um, the future of money. One is that cash is on its way out. Um, now, there are certainly some um, segments of the population, uh, maybe the elderly, the less technologically savvy, uh, who still um, uh, view cash as very important. In fact, there are many states and cities um, in the US that are trying to pass legislation, some have already done so, uh, that um, uh, businesses cannot um, deny customers the ability to pay in cash. I still pay my Uber drivers their tips in cash because the tactile element of cash and the personal connection um, to me is very important. But the reality is that as we move towards um, low cost and efficient digital payments, both for consumers and businesses, there are many advantages. You know, many businesses find it a real hassle uh, to deal with cash. It's um, prone to theft, it's prone to loss, um, it's prone to damage. So uh, for businesses, so long as they can get access uh, to low cost digital payments, um, they're going to start moving in that direction and businesses around the world are already doing so. And this provides some, um, you know, channels for financial inclusion um, through the new technologies. And we're going to see more and more channels of direct financial intermediation between savers and borrowers, um, uh, between businesses and consumers, between consu consumers and consumers. The other day I asked in my class about how many of my students use Venmo and virtually uh, every hand um, shot up. Um, but this is going to create some challenges, especially um, to the existing banks and financial institutions. And, you know, um, we may not uh, love our banks too much, but they play a very important role in finance. We think about central banks creating money, but it turns out that most money creation in modern economies, when we think about the money um, that facilitates uh, consumption, that facilitates you know, buying a house, uh, um, a car, or um, businesses taking loans to make uh, investments, um, those um, uh, are really fueled by money created by commercial banks. Um, so in modern economies, commercial banks are really crucial um, to the creation of money. So some of these challenges may have larger ripple effects. There are also potentially ripple effects in terms of international finance. So as you look at the landscape of currencies, um, uh, and my two previous books were about the two currencies uh, depicted here, uh, the US dollar and the Chinese renminbi. So there are questions also about whether the international monetary system is going to be affected as well. And there too, there are changes coming. 
um, these new technologies are going to make international payments a lot easier. Um, right now, international payments are even more complex than domestic payments because you have to deal with multiple financial institutions, multiple currencies, multiple regulatory regimes. Um, so international payments right now tend to be very cumbersome, very slow, difficult to track in real time. The new technologies um, uh, spawned by uh, Bitcoin are really making these payments a lot more efficient. Uh, and this is going to benefit you know, exporters and importers for their um, trading activities. It's going to benefit um, migrants sending um, uh, remittances back to their uh, home countries. Um, so I think there is a lot of change in prospect in areas where there are lots of inefficiencies in financial markets right now. There are going to be some challenges, not just for central banks in the large economies, but especially for smaller countries and uh, um, um, less developed economies. And um, one can well conceive of a digital version of the dollar or a digital version of the Chinese renminbi if it was easily available abroad, or even um, you know, Facebook's stablecoin DM, if that were easily um, available abroad, that could be trusted much more than the currencies of some of these economies. So you might have currency competition um, develop on an international scale um, and essentially wipe out the currencies of some of these smaller um, and less developed economies. But my view at least is that um, even though there might be some more inter intensified currency competition, um, the dollar is likely to remain the dominant store of value for a long time to come. Because ultimately, when you think about stores of value, as opposed to um, a currency for making payments, um, it's the institutional framework that matters as much as economic size and depth of financial markets. And you know, what is that institutional framework? It includes an independent central bank, the rule of law, an institutionalized system of checks and balances. And admittedly, each of these institutions uh, um, uh, came under attack in the last uh, few years, but they seem to have stood up um, at least moderately well so far. And in international finance, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be better than everybody else. And this combination of economic and financial might plus institutional framework that the US has, I think is going to keep the dollar in its um, position as the predominant currency uh, for a long time to come. But in the long arc of history, we are in a really fascinating um, period right now because we had um, a long time ago when money was first created, private currencies emerging issued by uh, merchants or um, uh, small financial institutions, including money lenders. Um, and then you had government currencies competing with, uh, um, with private currencies. The establishment of central banks, which were given the task of maintaining um, uh, faith in money, they essentially wiped out private currencies. But now we're coming back to a time where private currencies and uh, um, uh, fiat currencies issued by central banks may actually compete once again, at least in the medium of exchange function, although perhaps not in the store of value function. And as an economist, I think um, competition is a good thing so long as it is kept within bounds. But finally, I want to um, draw your attention to the point that as we think about these big issues, there are much broader issues that uh, uh, come to play um, uh, and that we need to consider very seriously. One of these is about the government's appropriate role um, in financial markets as well as in the economy. As I mentioned, countries are moving forward with issuing central bank digital currencies. This could um, make central banks and governments far more important in our economic and financial lives. And whether we really want central banks to be in this position, um, where they might end up getting a lot of deposits from um, households and uh, businesses and end up being in the position of having to allocate credit, or at a minimum, where they're going to have a window into a lot of our financial transactions, it is a serious question whether we want to live in that world. Um, on a more um, uh, uh, micro scale, one may also think about what sort of regulation the government can put in place, because ideally, you want a government to be playing a role where it is facilitating innovations by the private sector, and there are fantastic innovations underway right now in finance, 
But at the same time, you want to make sure that regulators are on the ball in terms of uh, um, uh, preventing us from having to deal with the risks that emanate from all these innovations. So striking that balance is a challenge that every regulator, every government um, is having to deal with. And this challenge is only going to intensify. And while technology is a wonderful thing, um, I think there are some real concerns about whether these innovations, like many of those we've seen in the past, might end up worsening certain economic and social problems that we're already confronted with. Um, we've seen certain new innovations like easy access uh, to trading platforms like the Robinhood platform, um, you know, drawing in a lot of um, relatively naive retail investors. And the problem is that if you were to try to buy Bitcoin now or to um, join in one of these speculative frenzies at the tail end of the party without um, being aware of the risks and getting um, caught up in the technological razzle dazzle, you may end up being the one um, who suffers the largest losses. So I think there are lots of issues here related to uh, making sure that there is sufficient investor protection. And that has to be largely done um, through increasing financial literacy and also making sure uh, that people don't get left out of this transformation because they um, do not have digital access. So there are some underlying problems such as inequities and in digital access and financial literacy that may mean that these new technologies end up um, actually exacerbating um, rather than dampening the existing problems. So um, as the title of my last chapter in the book uh, suggests, a glorious future beckons, but only perhaps. Thank you. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Uh, we welcome any questions to come into the uh, chat box now. We already have two questions. I'll, I'll start with one um, from Wayan, and please forgive my pronunciation if that's incorrect. How would a 100% rollout and adoption of a CBDC impact private banks? So um, first of all, um... I should make clear, um, in case I um, didn't earlier, that every central bank that is contemplating a CBDC is thinking about CBDC as coexisting with cash. Um, but I think the reality is that cash will organically um, uh, disappear because people will find digital payments much easier to use. Uh, Mayan's specific question was about um, whether if we all had CBDC accounts that could um, end up with disintermediation of the banking system. Um, I think there are safeguards that can be put in place. Um, I gave you an example of what the Bahamas has done, um, but what Sweden and China are doing, which might end up becoming the template for other countries, is creating what is called a dual tier approach or a two layer approach. Essentially, the um, central banks in these countries provide the digital tokens, which is the form that the CBDC takes, um, and it, they provide the payment infrastructure, but then the front end, that is the digital wallets in which CBDC balances are maintained, are actually maintained by the commercial banks. So the commercial banks maintain these non-interest bearing CBDC wallets in parallel with their interest bearing accounts, which are largely uh, digital, of course. So this keeps commercial banks in the game. It allows commercial banks also to undertake um, regulatory compliance um, uh, functions such as know your customer to make sure that these central bank digital wallets are really assigned um, to um, parties whose bona fides are checked. Um, and with limits on um, uh, the central bank uh, digital currency wallets, I think the disintermediation can be managed. And this dual layer approach has another um, attraction as well, which is that because the central bank just provides the tokens and the platform on which these payments can be made, you can now have private payment providers that innovate in how efficiently those tokens can be used. So you accomplish a number of objectives. You have a low cost digital payment system, but you keep the commercial banks in the game still. Um, you don't threaten them entirely and you still allow for private sector payments innovation. So it seems like the experiments underway right now are showing us ways in which some of these um, uh, risks can be mitigated. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, we have several questions coming in. This one is from Jonathan. Can you say a bit more about the ideological underpinnings of Bitcoin? Is there an anti-government libertarian bias at work? 
there is a hugely uh, libertarian um, uh, angle at work here because the whole point of Bitcoin was to um, create a, um, a form of uh, conducting transactions that did not require um, reliance on a third party such as a government, a central bank, or uh, indeed a financial institution. And that is the great hope um, of the decentralized finance community as well, that um, uh, a key aspect of decentralization is the community um, comes up with the rules, governs itself, um, and the community has a lot of self-correcting mechanisms in place so that malevolent actors do not end up dominating the system. Um, so that is the objective, but I think the irony here is that if you think about stable coins, for instance, um, they are cryptocurrencies, but they're not decentralized in the form that Bitcoin is, because you will have um, a particular company that will undertake the validation of the transactions, but they get the stability of their value because they are backed up by central bank issued fiat currencies. So that is one of the ironies. And the other irony is that um, um, cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, seem to actually benefit from the veneer of legitimacy that is given to them by governments. So in the US, for instance, the IRS uh, treats um, um, uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as financial assets. So in principle, you're supposed to report capital gains on financial assets. And I've actually, um, in the course of research for the book, found people saying that if the government uh, thinks it's okay and wants me to report it, then maybe um, they think it's okay. Um, so curiously, I think this, um, uh, role of the government um, may actually lead people into believing that Bitcoin is somehow okay. But of course, the whole point of cryptocurrencies um, was to sidestep the government and existing or traditional financial institutions. And a related question from Liam, do you expect corporate currencies to encounter significant regulation from governments? There is a lot of concern um, about um, uh, cryptocurrencies or stable coins issued by private corporations. Now, I should nuance something I said about Facebook. It's not exactly Facebook that it will be issuing this um, uh, cryptocurrency called DM. Facebook is one of the companies um, that um, uh, created this um, uh, association, which is now called the DM Association. It used to be called Libra. Uh, and Facebook claims that it's the association that will be claiming it. But it's not hard to imagine that uh, Facebook is the real uh, money and power behind this association. So um, uh, it is really seen as a Facebook currency. And given the enormous um, uh, reach of Facebook and given its um, extensive uh, financial clout, it's not hard to imagine that people, uh, especially in many countries where there are no trusted currencies, might view a Facebook issued currency as a much better way uh, to conduct financial uh, transactions. And this creates a lot of concerns for the government about um, whether uh, Facebook will, as with many other things, wash off its hands and say that if um, this cryptocurrency DM is used for illicit transactions, um, that is really not um, up to uh, it to police. Um, there are also concerns that cross-border um, illicit activities could be financed um, uh, through this and ultimately that it might become a financial risk uh, because even though it's supposed to have a stable value and is supposed to be backed up um, by reserves of either holdings of dollars or dollar denominated securities. There are questions about who is going to verify this um, and whether if many people try to change their DM back um, into US dollars at the same time, that might cause uh, a run on DM, um, so to speak, which might um, end up causing uh, financial problems with respect to other parts of the financial system. So almost certainly regulation is coming. Thank you. We have about a dozen questions in here, so I'm gonna uh, try to uh, rapid fire them. Uh, it's a question from Zhao. Is it, is it a possibility that embracing a cryptocurrency could increase the appeal of a currency as a global reserve currency? Um, not quite. I think a digital form of a currency is not going to change um, a currency status as a global reserve currency. And uh, um, taking the Chinese example, for instance, 
Certainly, if an ECNY was widely available outside China, I can well imagine being, it being used as a payment currency um, uh, for trade and financial transactions, but are investors going to trust it as a safe asset? Um, probably not. There is this interesting experiment of Ecuador, which recently declared um, Bitcoin to be legal tender. Um, and that is to me is um, uh, an exercise in desperation because Ecuador is a failing government, um, a central bank that is not very credible. For a long period, they've essentially abandoned their currency and have been using US dollars. So I think what Ecuador is trying to do is shake off what they view as dollar um, hegemony um, and perhaps also try to ride the Bitcoin wave. Uh, because after all, if Ecuador were to acquire a large number of Bitcoins right now and the value of Bitcoin were to rise in the future, um, that might give um, Ecuador uh, a lot of money to work with to plug the gaps in its government finances. I don't think it's going to work very well. Is an anonymous question. Do you think that POS cryptos will replace POW cryptos? Okay, that's an arcane question about um, the um, consensus protocols uh, that I spoke about. Bitcoin uses proof of work, which is I mentioned has a lot of inefficiencies. POS is proof of stake, uh, which is an alternative consensus protocol. Um, the second most important cryptocurrency, um, Ethereum is uh, going to move to proof of stake um, relatively soon. And there is talk that someday perhaps even um, Bitcoin will. Uh, that is a more efficient protocol and certainly um, uh, will allow for scalability of transactions uh, to a level um, that Bitcoin is not capable of right now. Um, so in the medium of exchange fund of cryptocurrencies, shifting to proof of stake would definitely set up the cryptocurrency um, in a position much better uh, capable of being, uh, being able to discharge that uh, medium of exchange function. There's a question from Ari. Do you see the possibility of a future in which money creation is taken over by decentralized finance instead of banks? Um, I think decentralized finance is going to um, have a lot of potential in terms of matching um, savers and borrowers. Now, one of the questions is whether um, the money creation that we see in modern economies through commercial banks can be replaced adequately by decentralized finance. And this is a couple of components, whether um, decentralized finance can be scaled up um, to the extent um, to which you have um, normal financial activities mediated by commercial banks. And second, um, whether you can have these fundamental functions of a banking system, which is maturity transformation, um, transforming short-term deposits um, into long-term loans and getting around information asymmetries can be managed uh, through a decentralized process. On the latter, I suspect the answer is yes. Um, on the former, I'm a little less um, um, sure. Um, certainly one can think about you know, Uber essentially solving a spatial coordination problem and money helps us solve an intertemporal coordination problem. And after all, um, you know, time is just another uh, dimension. Um, so maybe um, we just need to find the right technology that allows for better matching on the intertemporal dimension as well. But again, the tricky part here is that if you look at a broad monetary aggregate um, such as M2, which includes currency created by the central bank, but also commercial banks, in most economies, it's really commercial banks doing the creation of money. So um, I haven't come to grips quite yet uh, with this question about whether money creation can be undertaken by a decentralized financial system, even if it can conduct financial intermediation um, quite efficiently. The question from Mark, is there an analogy of NFTs to Bitcoin? So NFTs are um, certainly a, a remarkable, um, uh, you know, uh, new development. The fact that you have digital objects that uh, um, uh, people seem to be willing to put down so much uh, money for. And certainly uh, there is a parallel in that uh, objects such as Bitcoin um, and NFTs are largely digital objects. So if you own a Bitcoin, it's sort of like owning um, some other digital object. Um, and the question then again becomes, what is the intrinsic value? If you think about um, 
um, NFTs related to a piece of art, uh, digital art, maybe um, the owners get value, um, some sort of psychic value from having that. Uh, for Bitcoin, that value is supposed to come from its function as a medium of exchange, but it seems uh, that people seem to view it as a speculative asset. So there is a parallel here in terms of how investors' faith more than anything else um, seems to prop these up and the amount of faith out there seems to be enormous. Here's a question from Eric. What are your opinions on the future use cases uh, for non-CBDC stable coins, uh, for example, Tether, USDC, in a world where CBDCs are prevalent? So um, what stable coins are trying to meet is a real need um, for um, digital payment systems that are very easily um, accessible to the masses without having to rely on financial institutions. So when Facebook talks about DM, um, you know, at least it is couched in very noble terms of providing um, easy financial access to a lot of the world's population. So the need is there. Um, and the question is whether stable coins issued um, by private uh, corporations or private entities of any sort um, are going to have um, a viable existence if central banks issue their own uh, digital currencies. I suspect it's going to be hard to maintain a user case um, for privately issued stable coins if central banks are able to effectively issue um, CBDCs. But again, one might argue that we might see technological innovations taking place on top of CBDs, on the top of the CBDC architecture. Um, so uh, again, um, uh, as an economist, I see competition as good and I might take the let a thousand flowers bloom uh, approach to this. If stable coins building on CBDCs can provide even more um, uh, easy digital access to um, the underserved and underbanked uh, parts of the population here in the US um, and especially in low income and developing countries, uh, so be it. Um, but it's going to be a lot harder uh, to make that use case for stable coins if CBDCs are really rolled out efficiently and at scale. Cyrus asks, Bitcoin wastes an enormous amount of energy. You mentioned that other digital currencies are better in this respect. How much better are they? A lot better. Um, the proof of work protocol is really um, um, extremely um, energy intensive. Um, the proof of stake protocols use um, uh, a small fraction um, of uh, the proof of work consensus protocol. And there are other consensus protocols being developed, including um, by um, some of our colleagues at the um, Initiative for Cryptocurrencies um, at Cornell. Um, uh, they're doing fantastic work in terms of thinking about um, more efficient um, consensus protocols, efficient not only from um, an algorithmic sense, but also uh, from an environmental perspective. So um, that is coming soon. Nicholas asks, governments are notoriously protective of their monopolies on production of national currencies, which will be the first with a large scale GovCoin and what will it look like? As I mentioned, many um, countries are undertaking um, creation of central bank digital currencies and they have different motivations. Uh, but again, I would draw your um, attention to the observation that money creation in modern economies is not really dominated by central banks in the US. If you take this monetary aggregate of uh, M2, uh, you know, uh, only about 10% of it represents money creation by central banks, that is currency, as opposed to money created by um, uh, commercial banks. But certainly central banks want their money to retain a role um, and for people to have easy access to a low cost uh, digital payment system. And I think central banks are bowing to the reality that um, cash is not likely uh, to be around much longer. Um, uh, you know, cash has lasted for a long time. The first paper currency came out um, many centuries ago. The first paper currency was actually in the seventh century in China. And then in the 13th century, you had the first fiat currency uh, issued by um, the government of uh, Kublai Khan, the first unbacked um, legal tender. Um, so now we're coming again in the long arc of history to a time um, when the demise of cash might uh, end. And it's also, um, there is an interesting symmetry because the first paper currency appeared in China. Um, the first central bank was the uh, Swedish Riksbank. And those two countries right now are at the forefront of the move uh, towards uh, switching over to central bank digital currencies.
Uh, Lords asks, do cryptos threaten CBDCs or the other way around? I think they're going to coexist. Um, uh, although, again, having a government issued digital currency is going to make it much harder uh, for privately issued digital currencies, either stable coins or cryptocurrencies. Um, to be as viable um, as they are right now. But I think they're going to uh, remain for the foreseeable future um, speculative um, assets. Now, this is, uh, again, built on a very fragile foundation of faith uh, based largely on scarcity. Um, but, um, you know, when I was asked four or five years ago, would Bitcoin be a store of value? I emphatically said no. Um, and certainly it's had a pretty long run, but there have been many speculative bubbles uh, in history that have had very long um, runs and it seemed like they might go on. Um, and one day um, they crumbled. Um, I don't know if Bitcoin will crumble or not. I suspect uh, that it may not be very long in the tooth, but I think the real legacy that we should be thankful for is the technology um, that Bitcoin has bequeathed, which as I already said, is a marvel and has given birth um, to, I think, an entire uh, financial ecosystem that is going to have many advantages. We're out at five o'clock and out of respect of time, I'm gonna cut it to two more questions. Uh, one from Samuel, in countries like India and Nigeria, what could be some externalities that could arise from a transition to digital currencies? I ask this considering that there exists a large number of unbanked populations in those countries. Yeah, in those countries, financial inclusion really is a key imperative. And India has actually gotten a head start with something um, called the Unified Payments Interface. And I think um, India and I discussed this extensively in my book might be a good template for many other countries to follow in terms of what role the government should play. India has set up a pub, uh, public payments infrastructure, uh, but then provides easy access to it to all payment providers. Um, so payment providers can basically innovate on top of that layer. Um, and it is interoperable, meaning that because the uh, government provides the uh, payment uh, um, architect infrastructure, um, that different payment systems can then talk to each other. Um, plus, India has a biometric identification scheme for its um, uh, population called Aadhaar, um, which has brought a lot more people into the financial uh, net by giving them um, easily verifiable electronic identities. And India is also approaching the use of data in a very sensible manner. There is legislation on the table to make it clear um, that users um, whose data are used by private um, payment providers own the data and they, the users, get to determine how uh, the data can be employed um, by the private sector or perhaps even by the government. Uh, but financial inclusion is really a key imperative in these um, uh, middle income economies and uh, India's UPI plus India's um, CBDC and um, Nigeria's CBDC uh, may, may pave the path towards greater um, uh, provision of financial services. Okay, and the final question uh, from Beku Echuku, how can I be appropriately positioned to capitalize on the gains of CBDCs? I think you just need to sit back and uh, wait for these developments uh, to take place. But one thing you can certainly do is contribute to the intellectual and design development um, of this entire new financial uh, ecosystem. And as I mentioned, there are many um, students um, uh, and faculty at Cornell, in addition to the Initiative for Cryptocurrencies, there is the uh, Cornell FinTech um, Initiative um, as part of the uh, Johnson um, College of Business. So uh, uh, William Song and uh, um, um, others are leading the um, work on that front. Um, so there are many ways in which um, um, uh, whether or not you profit from it, you can certainly intellectually contribute uh, to the development of the technology and the ideas right here at Cornell. Thank you again for coming to our book talk today. We very much appreciated sharing this hour with you to learn a bit more from Dr. Prashad about what promises to be one of the most potent developments in of modern finance in our century. To find out more about the future of money, I encourage you to visit the publication's website noted on this slide. Man's next book talk will feature Professor Phil McMichael of Cornell Global Development, who will be presenting his book, Development and Social Change, A Global Perspective on Tuesday, November 2nd. For details on that talk and all the other book talks lined up by Cornell University Library for the fall, please visit the link to the book talk schedule posted to the chat. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.
Thank you, Tom. Thank you to all your man colleagues and to all those of you who took the time to, um, to be present for my talk. This has been a production of Cornell University Library.